I'd love to know the design phases of this thing. You worked on this? Yeah. Yep. Well, you designed the front panel, mm -hmm. but you worked intimately on managing. Did you manage the development? No, no. No, okay. No, so right. I'm a technology manager. I, one of the things I do is I work with teams to create common building blocks that could choose between all the projects. Got it. And I'm often brought in to help them go over a particular difficult technical challenge. Mm -hmm. So for example, on the high-end uh, function generator, they had some horrendous problems with the switching power supplies to power up all the high-power ASICs, ah. creating spurs yeah, yeah. into the output of the funk gen. Because at yep. 120 megahertz, oh, yeah. it, it doesn't it, take much to yeah. get bad noise output. And I brought in some power supply people to help them redesign all the power supplies mm -hmm. to reduce the noise. Because our power supply group is really good at low-noise switching. Yep. They were not good at low-noise switching, but they had tons of power requirements because they have giant ASIC yeah. in there, or giant FPGA, I should say, and some really high-current DACs and A to Ds. Or not mm -hmm. A to Ds, but you know, just high-power circuits. So the, the switching circuits they put in were like larger than they had ever designed before, and mm -hmm. they're not experts on switching power, yep. but the folks in New Jersey are. So I got right. involved, and I got another guy involved, and we redesigned their entire power subsystem for them so they could stay on track on the project. Mm -hmm. There's, when they hit a wall, rather than say, you guys better fix it, work 12-hour days for the next three months, no, that's not how we're going to do it. We're mm -hmm. going to bring in people who know how to do it and get it right quickly so you don't yep. delay the project three months and don't burn out. We get it done right and get it done once. So I'll do that. I'll, uh, the folks who developed their SMUs didn't know how to do this kind of graphics interface. Right. So I had the, the team that developed the, the, the firmware for this and our hardware design for this, and we transferred that stuff to our J Japanese team that did the SMU. So the Mount, the Mount Fuji project was our, our new SMU to compete with our, our folks in Cleveland, and they leveraged all that stuff from mm -hmm. the other designs. They used the same, same circuit designs. They took the schematics and transferred them, yep. and then they built it up from there. Um, that's what I do is I help make those connections. So the development process, you need a replacement mm -hmm. for the, what is it, 34401? Oh, yeah. 34401. Um, did you come up, was it, what shipped? Was that the original concept? How many, evol or what sort of evolution did you go through? So did you go like, we're going to have a graphical screen, it's going to have the it's going to have the graphene and it's going to have this and how? We already had the, um, the function generator at that point. Oh, okay. The function generator was pretty right. much the first major product. The counter and the function generator were developed more or yep. less in parallel. Um, so we had the basic structure, but it didn't meet the cost target. So that's when we had okay. to kind of crush yep. it and, and reduce the cost dramatically. And that's where I got heavily involved. But the mm -hmm. DMM technology, believe it or not, was actually taking the... We had done a research project on replacing the 3458, which we ended up putting aside. And that team stopped working on that, and then we had them go and do a dramatic cost reduction to fit it in these kind of price points Interesting. and yep. strip it down and simplify it. And then the team, you know, in, in our Loveland, Colorado site, came up with the, the voltmeter to make it meet the cost targets. I came up with the, the new low-cost front panel, and we merged the whole thing together. But this architecture is dramatically different than the 34401. Yes. The 34401, the, the fundamental problem with the voltmeter is that it's isolated. Mm -hmm. And the 34401 has the entire processing core next to the measurement engine. Yep. And it directly controls the measurement engine. And the entire front panel is floating right next at the, to at yeah, the yeah, measurement yeah. at the measurement yeah. potential. That worked back in the day of GPIB and RS-232, because we could isolate GPIB and RS-232 over very simple UARTs. Uh -huh. There's a chip called the uh, um, <coughs> the ALF protocol, which basically takes and isolates that mm. and brings it across isolation into a custom ASIC. And that's great for GPIB and RS-232, but, but when you get to USB and LAN, it can't be done. Yep. You need processing right yeah. next to the LAN and USB, because mm -hmm. it's all grounded. Um, you can't isolate USB and LAN very easily at the high speeds. So, so you changed the architecture entirely to put the processing grunt, which did, controlled the screen and did all the processing, right. at the back end, so to speak. That's correct, that they, what right. we call the ground potential. Um, yep. So the, the front panel display also, because this is, would be floating, that mm -hmm. was a problem. Isolating this so it's safe with a flat panel display is a little bit more challenging than with a vacuum fluorescent display. Ah. It's a little bit easier to keep the right. cracks from giving you, you know, shock hazards. So, yeah. um, this th also the LCD display has to be directly connected to the processor. Yes. All right, the 24 lines. I mean, it's a very yeah. wide bus. So all that had to get moved to ground. So they had to develop a whole new protocol to a much smaller set of hardware that controlled the actual measurement engine. Yeah. So they developed a whole new system to do that for this project and that's what enabled these products to do what they did using the same processor platform for the most part that's in the counter, the function generator, right. and our power products as well. 
Got it. So we ended up using FPGA for the measurement. There's engine. an FPGA and a single chip. And a single. What's the single chip? The single chip does the communications across isolation. Yep. Oh, okay. And does the slower state machines. Yep. And the FPGA does the high speed processing of the delta sigma A to D. Mm -hmm. So it does the big fur filter that basically takes this this A to D converter, you know, doing high speed sampling of multiple bit and then turning that into a slow, very high resolution reading. So cost was paramount. Was it the entire driving factor behind this? So, well, there were two. One would be complete compatibility with the existing product because it was so ubiquitous largest and selling integrated in, into in, in test and largest, se history. largest selling product in test and measurement in your peak, company in my history? company probably or in any of our test and measurement test companies because the we are the biggest wow. but the 34401 yeah. at its peak sold over 25,000 a year that's crazy yeah we're not back up to that with this but yep. we're heading there with some of it is because right. competitors have come in and taken some away but uh, and it's still so, growing this is yep. still growing quite nicely but uh that's so there was compatibility and there was cost seemed to be the two absolutely driving factors nothing else well, and also well, differentiation we had to add new capabilities right. we had yep. to do the new graphics display yeah, yeah. we've added data logging we've added histograms things mm -hmm. like that which you know today they're very useful exactly yeah. but the point is you got a graphics display damn it use it yeah you know yeah. um and that's it's not just a different way to control the thing because the menuing system on the 3441 is not as easy to use as no. this but it, it's hard to justify switching all that just for that. Right. So you might as well get more data. And there's more things we'd like to do with the display, but, you know, mm -hmm. and they did some newer things, I think, with the 65 and 70, if not mistaken. They have dual parameter information. Yes, yes, they yes, everything. they do. There is a dual display. Right. Yep. That wasn't in the first <coughs> one. We, we didn't have enough time to fit that in. Right. They wanted to, but when we got the 65 and 70, they added that. And frankly, with the 34, 410, and 11, they had the mm -hmm. dual parameter in a vacuum fluorescent. Yeah. And when we first introduced the, the the more basic models, we didn't have it, and we got feedback that that was a problem. They liked the dual display, right? So we they yep. fixed it and they, they rolled it out in the 65 and 70. The biggest challenge in this was when they developed the 34401. Literally, they were on the second floor of a building, and the manufacturing center was on the first oh, floor. Okay? So good. So it was very easy to optimize yeah. cost and learn what how you're going to cost us, what the rules for engagement were right. to optimize it in the right way. Now this thing is manufactured in a CM, not even in our Penang operation. Oh, okay. And our the supply chain, the, the transformer is made in Kwantan, Malaysia. Right. Okay. And back then we bought it from a local vendor. Mm. All right. And therefore optimizing it, the perfect shielding to get the common mode noise, all those things was much easier. You got in your car, you drove to their site, mm -hmm. and in an hour you have a meeting, you get the thing, and then you got to move the shield this way. Yep. No. You know, no problem. Easy. Now it's a third party through our Penang oh. operation back to the States. And, yep. the, and getting the cost of it and getting the performance of it is much more difficult. So one of the other things I do is I help, I go to Penang fairly frequently and they had an issue with the vendor we were using, they weren't meeting the cost. I actually traveled to China to visit another new company mm -hmm. to, because I, I do a lot of magnetic materials work for people because of our power supply background and I visited, visited the news comp, this new company and vetted them out and made sure they could do a quality job and, and help communicate our technical needs and they're now meeting cost on that much better than they were before. Is the reason you went to a contract manufacturer, a CM, for that you were using the terminology there, is it is that purely a price point thing, <laughs> or like why don't you? I mean, you've got your own huge manufacturing it's, facilities. We do, and it's an right? interesting story. It, it's, some of it, I think, in retrospect, we might not have done. But let me play the whole thing out. First of all, keeping up with the latest surface mount board loading technology, mm -hmm. it's very expensive and it's constantly changing. And but we, you're not going high density and stuff like this. Well, we're not as high density as some yep. products, but. We're, we're certainly using smaller and smaller parts everywhere. And fine pin pitch BGAs and, and pain and in the butt. 0402s like and even right. 0201s in some cases. And right. you know, uh, DFNs, which you know are almost as bad as BGAs. <laughs> yeah. um, and you know we're moving toward you know three and four thousands traces in spaces. So oh, okay. Things get denser only because that's what the packages are coming out in. And yeah. they're smaller and you try to fit more functionality and less space. It, it, you have to. But the point was our company made a decision to get out of board manufacturing because we this was back, we got back mm -hmm. at it after it just went surface mount and the equipment was already starting to evolve and change. And keeping up with it and doing it in a quality way, and as Rojas happened too, yeah, we didn't want to make that investment. Better I'll leave it to the you can buy experts. It. Yeah, okay? you can buy so, that service. So we moved the boards out yeah. and when we moved the boards out, we still did the assembly of the final product in our own site in mm -hmm. Penang. But then we were still part of the, and this is kind of a related thing, is that we were still part of Agilent at the time. Right. Agilent was still building their life sciences products in the States. Ah. In, um, in fact, in Delaware and a few yep. other locations. 
And they looked at our cost of manufacturing was much lower in Penang, and they said, we want to move that stuff to Penang. Oh, no, so, they're about to invade. Well, our factory is only so big. <laughs> yeah. And they said, you guys got to move out to make space for them to move in. Oh, okay? goodness. So we basically started, to, we went to the CMs who were building our boards and said, we want you to build our products. And uh, they said, that's mm. no problem. We right. have your business. And yeah, yeah. Uh, we started to move a lot of the products out of our local. And the idea, too, was that was to lower our indirect overhead. They were more efficient at manufacturing because they do a whole lot more of it mm. than we do, and it was even less expensive. And also, one of the other benefits is that they often have small shops in the U.S. that we can work with for prototypes, even at the final product level. And for some products where the volume is very small, we would just stay in the U.S. So yeah. we, could, we could do more localized manufacturing and get quicker turnaround and faster response time for low-volume specials and high-value products. So we made a decision to move our manufacturing out of our factories to local vendors right in the Penang area mm -hmm. or down in Johor and places like that. Um, that created some challenges, some transition challenges. We're not completely through that, but we're mostly through it. Most of the stuff has moved out. Some of the very old products we didn't move because we're not going to keep them for that much yeah. longer. So if you go in, in Penang now, you'll see production lines for our products, but they're mostly the old through hole and you know, older Interesting. stuff that we don't want right. to spend the money to move it because it costs a fair amount of money to yeah. transfer all the test sets and training and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff to other people. So one of the challenges for this was this was introduced as we were starting to make some of those transitions. Right. And we were, we were still able to keep it. We tried to do the new products in our factory and then move it at first. Now we do direct to CM. The new products go right to the CM first product. This product was still built in our Penang operation and moved out after it went into production. But the newer versions of the product are going right to the oh, I noticed that. I've got one of the original made in Penang mm -hmm. ones. Yep. Well, everything's made in Malaysia, but not yeah, all yeah, that yeah. stuff is made right. in our factory. So it's, it's an interesting challenge, and I, I think the CMs have been uh, exceptional, frankly, at doing mm -hmm. a, a good job. It still takes a lot of scrutiny on our part and review yep. and keeping the quality high, but these are big, big corporate companies. They know how to do mm -hmm. a good job, and they, we think the flexibility long term is going to be good for us, Excellent. being able to move things around. And, you know, if, if a customer needs a special and they have a facility, one, one of the three, I'm not going to name all the CMs we use, but is really good at transferring between the different sites. Mm -hmm. That's one of their skills. And we're seeing that as a potential way for us to respond quickly for modifications and specials and new yep. needs. So we'll see how that pans out. Some of these things, you know, I wouldn't do myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this one is or isn't, but yep. this one's worked out okay. okay. And our goal is long term is to lower cost and get more responsiveness. Yes. Back. Do you know what the issue there was? Absolutely. It's a, it's yeah, a, you do. Tell it's us. A very interesting story. Tell, oh, tell us the so, interesting story so, about how this was respect. <laughs> it came out at a thousand volts spec. And then, so, did somebody realize, or did you guys realize that there was an issue? There wasn't an issue. Oh, there wasn't an issue. It was a bit blown out of proportion. A bit of blown out of proportion. Okay, do, do tell us, anyway. Okay, so what happened yep. was, we had a customer who was very interested in our voltmeter to reduce the amount of calibration they had to do, and mm -hmm. they wanted us to create a custom version of it they built into their system. Oh, and, and you would do that for a big enough customer? For a big enough customer that would pay us enough, sure. Right, yeah, right. And it was also strategic in that we wanted to learn more about their needs. So sometimes we justify things by saying this is a door in to learn more about their needs. Mm -hmm. And in certain growth areas, we like to do that. And the team that was going to do that was in one location, and they took the design of this and they were going to reform factor it into a card that went in the customer system. Ah. So they're going over the design, effectively doing a complete design review, and they noticed that one of the parts in the design. The, the voltage across the part was above the rating on the part. Which part do you know? Or I'm you not going to say. Not going to say. Okay. okay. Right. And no. what happened was they said this is unacceptable and mm -hmm. you can't do this. And they they said it's a safety issue, which it wasn't. And they alerted some people. Uh, and uh, and panic ensued. And panic ensued. And the, the knee jerk reaction was to make a change to cause safety first. Uh, a change to the spec. Uh, change mean? to the spec and yep. say don't do that because yep. we said this could be a safety issue. Mm -hmm. And the reality was that upon further review, it was not a safety issue. But but you did publish the spec, you did revise it and published it, and hence why it was noticed by people on the forum. Oh, big time, sure. Yeah, yeah. And it's right. not a safety issue, and right. the part is acceptable to use in that application that way, and since then it pushed it back to 1,000 volts. And so you've changed the spec back and everything's hunky-dory. Yes. So there were no changes made? No changes made. Right. New people okay. looked at it and said, this isn't... Right. Right. And it turns out it was right, but people, it's one of these things we've done it that way for so long, no one remembered anything about it. Right. But it turned out one of the things that got it back to the right was we took our competitors' products, they did it the same way. Ah. Okay. And then finally but, the people yeah. who had not looked at this in a long time said, you know, maybe we need to rethink, is this really right. wrong? And figured out it wasn't, wasn't okay. wrong. Okay. And it's back on track. 
you know, we don't get everything perfect every time. Sure. And it's such a complex set of situations. Yeah, yeah. Safety is we take very, very, very seriously. Yep. So I say if we're going to have a knee-jerk reaction, I'll, I'll take it there. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, it did upset people, and it was a mistake, and we, we undid it. Yep. But, uh, and did. everyone's happy with it now? Everyone accepts your explanation? Well, then maybe they will now. I don't know if they're looking at this, but that's that is what yeah. happened, and it yep. was uh, it was unfortunate that it caused a disruption and wasted our customers' time, wasted our internal time. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, that you get judged by when you get it right yep. at the end. And, yes, and exactly. We're sorry that we accidentally thought something wasn't as safe as it really was. Yep. But that's but on the cautious side. That's right. Yeah, a lot of companies would have just oh, don't worry about that. We probably could have gotten this one right sooner and not had the disruption. Right. If okay. But I think it was, yeah. it was a little knee jerk on our, on our part. But if we're going to do a knee jerk, on, I'll take it here. Yep. Okay. So that's what interesting. Happened. I was actually involved in that. Oh, okay. Because yeah, right. power supplies have a lot of safety issues, especially yes. switching offline yep. power supplies. So I was pretty familiar with it, and I was one of the people that knew it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. But the certain people thought there were too many opinions in the room and told me to stand down. And I said, Right. Okay. Okay. And then it finally came around. You know. I'm not saying I'm glad I was right. I'm glad they got, they got it right. Yep. That's what matters. All right. It wasn't one of our best days. <laughs> <laughs> got it. But it all worked out well. Yes. Excellent. Say, um, compliance, uh, you know, the cat testing and stuff like that. Not so much the bench meters, but hand, very important in handheld Absolutely. meters and things like that. Have you ever sent something away that's, you know, like failed and they've come back and say, hey, or oh, hey, this is not going to pass or something like that? Or you, do you guys always get it right first time? You're so experienced at it? No, we don't get it? it right first time. No? It's a challenge and, and frankly the new IEC 6101 yeah, that we have to comply one. with is much more challenging. Yes. One of the subtle things... What's, what's the major change for those? One of the biggest remember? changes is that you have to anticipate likely mistakes the customer might make. Right. If that causes a safety hazard, it's a problem. As in operational mistakes, everything. probes in the wrong, everything? Probes in the wrong. So, for example, on our new yep. power analyzer, which can measure 1,000 volts right. and isolated 50 amps of current isolated wow. from the 1,000 yeah. volts, um, we have BNCs for the, the current input, if you want to put an external <laughs> transducer on the current right. input. And when we went to put the triggers that are at ground reference, we can't because they could plug the thousand yes. volt isolated thing onto the BNC. Being onto the two different things. connectors. Yeah. You know, you can't just put a label on the back saying don't do that anymore. Right. You have to anticipate likely wow. mistakes and it still has to be safe. We could have had it hook up to there if we made it a 25 amp BNC. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay? That's the kind of thing, you, you know, that's going to start shifting us into doing yep. ways. You can't just put a label saying if you're stupid, you're going to get hurt. Right. You know, it's not good it, enough It's anymore. not acceptable. It won't pass compliance. That's correct. Interesting. And that's relatively new and... Uh, but that's not a bad thing. No, it's a no, smart thing. Good. It's a smart thing, yeah. but you know, <laughs> certainly something that you, you see examples where that was the that was the way you handled it. You just mm. said, you know, oh, can't we just put a label? You can't. You don't do that. And right. You can't just put a label anymore. Yeah. Um, we were having an issue in, in some certain of the power supplies where the the binding post can only handle twenty amps. Right. And we're gonna we're gonna have forty amps. So <sighs> yep. what, what do you do? Well, if they pull forty amps out of a twenty amp binding post, it melts. Yep. And it can create yes. a hazard. It's hot to touch. Right. Can burn of your course. hands. So we can't do that anymore. It used uh -huh. to be just. You know, we put a, a sense leads on the front yeah. panel that say, you know, uh, 20 amps max. And that oh, okay. and then it throttles it. No, no, there's no. no throttle. It just says, don't do that. Oh, Don't right. pull more than 20 don't, amps right. out of this. Okay. That's not acceptable anymore. Ah, it was up right. until I see the new, the Rev 3 yep. of the IC 61010. So those are some of the standard challenges. And one of the other things we did many, many years ago for our power products was we switched from an offline system to a 48 volt grounded mm -hmm. system. We use a distributed DC system. And that's made safety a lot easier to meet for us right. and shorten development times because even though our output floats a lot off ground, say 240, our input is only 48 volts and it's grounded. Got it. As opposed to being 400 plus mm -hmm. with a PFC front end. So that's yep. actually simplified safety for us a lot and shortened development times and made our performance higher. Mm -hmm. um, and that directly because we found that the time was taking to all that primary related circuitry to pass safety was, was increasing test times and compliance testing and certification dramatically. Now we buy a pre-certified brick, if you yep. will, that handles all that thing. And you're seeing that with a lot of other products. They, oh, buy, yeah. these, they buy these choke snake things or the, you know, the phone mm -hmm. charger type solutions for low power and all the safety is inside that yes, charger. Yes, that's right. And that makes things a lot simpler. You're mm -hmm. going to see more of that for low cost products. You may Got even it. see it for a low cost voltmeter. Ah, oh, interesting. Okay. Because it's just to do all the compliance testing and yep. the cost to do it is it's quite a bit higher. And those choke snake things and the little plugs in the wall for the phone mm. chargers are getting higher and higher in power. Yep. You know, then nowadays you can... Oh, it's crazy. Your phone your, your phone can put out, can take in like 60 watts Yes. Now. 
It's so fast for quick charge yeah. three. You can take in like 12 volts at five amps or something like that. Yeah. So you can get little tiny plugs that can put out 100 watts. You know, it's one inch. It's That's more than enough to power a voltmeter. Oh, easily. <laughs> it's crazy. Speaking of power, um, is does standby power consumption? You mentioned power factor correction, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. Is that a big deal in test and measurement? <laughs> is it a requirement? Like, do it's you not care? a requirement. It's not. It is something we care about. I know right. the new one we just came out with. People are a little upset because the, the the power when it's off is not really off. And we're actually working on the, the newer ones, and we're going to make it lower. The newer what? Which product? Sorry? I can't tell you. What oh, product. okay. Right. We're, we're continuing. Oh, to this is an internal, still yeah. under development. Still under development. Ah, right. We're continuing okay. to refine that. Right. Um, and somebody internally went, "Hey, this is drawing X amount of watts." Well, they noticed the fan was spinning very slowly. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They noticed the fan was spinning because we don't completely yeah. turn power off, and it turns out that we use a, a PWM fan, and PWM fans can make the fan go much slower, so it's quiet. Yes. But they never stop completely. Right. So the new designs, we have to get a switch to turn the fan off, so you won't yep. notice it's yes because it's not. So it, just a little <laughs> nuisance, if you will. So there's no requirement if a scope take you know has a power factor of 0.5 or something. You don't. Well, is nowadays that that PFC you? power factor, full power PFCs. Yep. You know, even low power, the PFCs are available down to what less than 100 watts. So mm. it will have a power factor. Almost any product today will have a power factor of 0.98 or 0.99. Right. It used to be PFC was only used at 600 watts and up. Mm -hmm. Now it's even a 45 watt brick has a PFC. Has a, right. Yeah, because it's, it. It, the chips have gotten so cheap, and it actually yep. above a certain power level, it's actually cheaper to have PFC than not. Ah. The components, the, the amount of loss savings in the parts makes yep. up for the extra cost of the circuit. Ah, you can get a PFC. The whole PFC fits in a single little hybrid that they make for 50 cents. Oh, really? Yeah, it's super wow. cheap now. That's um, great. You still need a choke and things yeah, like that, yeah, a little bit bigger input filter, but uh, no, we. we we do care about p uh, power efficiency at full power. Mm -hmm. I thought you were asking about energy Oh, I'm at both. It, yeah, it's both. a two-part question. We yeah. are interested in getting the power <coughs> lower on the bench. People do not like when it sits there and consumes a lot of power. Yeah. But there's kind of a threshold of about 10 watts. Energy Star is yeah. like a 10-watt number in the U.S. I think it's equivalent in Europe that they like it to be below something. But it's not regulatory for test and measurement equipment. It is for right. consumer products. It's is against the law for consumer products. Got, yep. Right. So test and measurement gets a free ride. Well, PFC, we got a free ride, but we still right. pay attention to it because yep. it's, it's, it's a free ride for us to get it. Yeah, yeah. So, right. But we do we do have to pay attention to it for standby power yep. um, because people don't like the, those big, ugly push switches. Are oh, pain. what do you mean big, ugly? I like the <laughs> big clunking power switch. It takes a lot of space up. Yeah, I know. It's yeah, you've got to have a plastic rod to go back. Those break. You, you wouldn't believe how easy those things break. And how yes, much yes, they, they do. I've broken tool. a few doing teardowns. Yeah. Yeah. So well, not even turn it. No, they just break during assembly. During assembly. Ah, <laughs> right. Or maybe then get a bit brittle and then break in the field. That's right. Right. Yeah. So everything. So we're doomed towards. We're going to more soft switching. Soft for sure. switching. Mm. Well, it also helps boot times because yeah, we pre-boot. Yeah, okay. it's, it's sort of waiting. It's halfway through the boot process, yep. so you hit the switch, it comes right back up. Right. And, but it does draw a slight amount of power, and yep. we're working to get that lower and lower over time. How low can you get? Like. What do you have like a time like anything under a watt because it's a nice round number or? Well, what like limits it is because we're using brick supplies. Right. This is using a transformer, which yes. means that the transformer is engaged and the the power supplies on the output of that are engaged. So this is actually there's a limit to how low we can get this, but with yep. the, the the little supply, the brick switching supplies, they mm -hmm. actually are designed for consumer products. So they right. can often spec that they go less than a watt when yep. they're in standby. Um, and then, then they have a small power supply that comes out that keeps a little bit of circuitry alive. No right. different than your TV yep. has just a small amount of circuitry and for the infrared for the infrared to yeah. detect you want to turn it on. Yeah. yeah. So right. that that architecture is slowly seeping into our products to minimize the power, and you can get those down to like very very low, like 100 milliwatts or something. Right. Like that. Fantastic. Yeah. That that one button is separate from all the other buttons, basically. Yep. The, speaking of the competitors, yes, like especially in the power supply market. I mean. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous what you can get for, like on e you know, you can get a bench power supply for 50 bucks on eBay, mm -hmm. including delivery probably, right? No, maybe not, because yeah. they're still the a bit heavy, is, unless they're switch boxes, mode. Right? Eight bucks right. switch. Yeah. But yes. it's, it's just crazy. Are you, like, at what price point, at what price point of instruments will you not go on? Is there a price point where you'll go, look, we won't bother? Today, there's probably a price point that's 500 Something like that. Right. You can see the new scope is yep. starts it's, at five hundred. Yeah, yeah. um, but that's just a temporary situation. Our long term okay. goal long -term is to, goals to go lower. Go where we need to go to be effective. Now, Interesting. If someone makes something that we don't think customers should have on their bench because it's going to cause more problems than it's worth, right. we won't go there, obviously. Right. Just because someone else makes yep, it doesn't yep. mean 
we want to put that product out. So Got that it. $25 product may be fine if you're powering up a, a non-electronic load, mm -hmm. for example, but mm -hmm. it's going to have tons of ripple. It's going to yeah. be slow. Yeah. It's, it's not going to necessarily be reliable. It's yeah. not going to be easy to use. You know, we're never going to make that product, Got to it. be honest with you. Yeah. But there's there's no reason we can't do a $500 product as evidenced by the yeah, scope. Of course. We can, we can address those spaces right. in, in power. Um, in everywhere. It takes time yep. for us to turn our organization around to really get the efficiencies and the infrastructure we need to be effective, but we're on a path to do it. Awesome. Is there enough margin still at that low end? There is. To make it, or do you have to make it up in volume? Like, it's, well, you obviously volume's, volumes, <laughs> volume's make the a, point. Of volume the, makes a big difference. The, common design, yeah. common parts, and m excellent engineering. Got it. It really requires some of the best engineering. It's actually, to me, just like you're doing a six and a half or even an eight and a half digit yep. DMM requires some of the best engineering in the world, low cost product design is an art unto itself. Component obsolescence. Big pain issue. in the butt. Big Huge issue. Pain in the butt. It's total wasted effort. You know, you already got a design that works, you can ship it and you yep. have to spend money to make it continue to ship. And the problem is anything you change in that digital domain, you have to repeat all the testing. All mm -hmm. the environmental testing, RFI, ES, right. ESD, because the new chip could be sensitive when the old chip wasn't. Of course. That stuff costs big bucks. Yep. And strangely enough, you may have tested it last time and gotten lucky. Right. And didn't know. And then you right. tested it the second time and it had nothing to do with the change you made ah, in your fence. Yes. Just because last time maybe they changed the test setup slightly or the, you, the units mm. you tested last time are a little less sensitive and you fail and had nothing. So you end up fixing in something that wasn't what you started out to do. Wow. Most, most common parts that Ro go obsolete? ROM and RAM. ROM and RAM. By far. Because um, DDR has registers that you've got to write specific. DDR has registers you have to configure, so you have to change the code sometimes to, right. to change the DDR. Uh, ROM, oh, cause, yeah, because I would have thought, oh, it's just pin compatible, right? They're so jelly Sometimes it is, but you still have to do all the testing. Right. Um, and then sometimes it isn't, and you have to change the configuration for the DDR. That's one of the ones we run into. The, the mm -hmm. other big one that's been a big headache recently was, um, and I think it's more of a glitch in time, was FPGAs. Right. Yes. One of the two big FPGA vendors moved their foundry mm -hmm. from one company in Taiwan to another company in Taiwan. Because yeah. the first company, I guess, wasn't working for them very well, it wasn't on the latest and greatest technology. And they decided they didn't want to build anything at the old company. So they started obsoleting a lot of the parts that were making an old company. Right. Well, it's extremely painful to change yep. FPGAs. The pinouts never Absolutely. the same. No, no. Um, the older FPGAs weren't yeah. done with full HDL. They were schematic based. Uh -huh. And the new tools don't want that. Uh -huh. They don't accept the schematics. And the documentation on an FPGA is never good enough. You can just hand it to someone else. You yep. get the old original engineer involved if they're still around. And it, it's just, we've spent a lot of money and time doing it. We're getting good at it. but. Do you have to get, I've worked in uh, in industry where we have to get like a guaranteed, a written guarantee signed by the CEO that they will keep this part alive for 10, 15, 20 years. We um, don't do that. You, we you buy large buy? quantities when they right. tell us they're up. Oh, okay. We, do a last buy. We do a bridge buy. <laughs> yeah. The problem is our products, you know, the test and measurement industry and, and power supplies in particular have the longest product lives. Yep. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. 20, 30 years. It's right. right. Yeah. Now. The newer product families for this particular FPGA vendor, since they've moved to the new foundry, they're mm -hmm. moving out the, deliver, the lifetime date they're going to make them for because right. it's working very well for them and they're not trying to get out of it. But, you know, once bitten, twice shy. Yeah. So we're, we're taking a more uh, full documentation approach. And we're doing more training so people can take over and move, move the mm -hmm. design more easily in the future. Moving completely away from schematic-based designs yep. as much as possible to fill full HDL, which recompiles in any of the tools. Right. So that's going to help us, but hopefully this was a one-time glitch. The analog stuff, there's been some interesting parts that have gone away, especially mm -hmm. in like power supply control, you know, regulators right. and stuff yeah. like that have gone away um, because companies do it for consumer products. Like, you know, they've done a really high volume part for a consumer product and then they make a better product. They don't sell anymore the old ones. So they don't want to make it anymore. Right. We designed it in foolishly and yes. then we have to fix it. Those are not as big of an issue, but we still have to retest the whole product. Yep. You know, and it, it's a bit of a pain. And it, of course, it's bad if they're bigger, but most of the time the switching chips are smaller the next time. Right. So it's easier and they're more efficient and they, they work better. And So there's advantages to do it. Sometimes you go through the well, pain. Well, it's never an advantage doing it in the sense that the product's shipping the way it was. We didn't need to change it. You're now right, we have to spend money and time. So yeah, yeah. the fact that it's a little bit smaller, well, the space was there for the bigger part. It doesn't help us. Right. Certainly in a new design, we'll move to the newer chip, but we're forced to get rid of it in an old design. It, kind of stinks, frankly. It's, it's a problem that's never going to go away. 
really well, is it? It goes away by doing more modularization. Okay. And when you do modularization yep. and you put things in the right groupings, we've made some relatively foolish mistakes in some of our products where we've grouped things that shouldn't have been grouped together. Uh -huh. So, for example, this product was a good example. This product, the A to D's and D to A's are on the same board with the power supply. Mm -hmm. So, that means we have five different versions of this board. So, when that A to D changes, we have to right. redo, we, gotta do we have the to build. Board. Yep. Yeah. So what we've done in the newer products is all the digital control is on a little plug-in board the yes. size of a memory module, right. and that snaps in, and then we mm -hmm. actually use that to upgrade the performance of the product. We have different versions, but also when that part goes obsolete, that board is common to all the family. Got it. Okay? And that's helping us, nice. so we only have to do it once, and then we yep. just pop it in and do the retest. So making some smart decision about partitioning helps mm -hmm. the, the part of obsolescence quite a bit, but sometimes it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs>